Hi everyone, good morning. This morning we are joined by Tamara Shetfield, our Medical Director for Community Health and Prevention to give an update on the COVID-19 vaccination process that's been happening here in the state of Utah. Tamara, thank you so much for joining us. It's nice to talk to you again. It's great to be with you, Amanda. So I wanna start talking about this vaccination by explaining what mRNA is to the public. Can you give us an explanation of what this vaccine is? Yes, yeah, so the two vaccines that are out there, the Pfizer vaccine and Moderna vaccine in the United States are both mRNA vaccines. What it means is that there is a small amount of uh, genetic code that is surrounded by lipid a nanoparticle that when it's injected, it enters the cell, not into the nucleus that has our DNA or anything, but just into the um, part of the cell that creates proteins, the, the things that help us um, do our, our activities that we need within our body. And so the mRNA is coded to create a protein called the spike protein um, of the, uh, co the coronavirus. The COVID vaccine um, is targeted so that this, this spike protein is really the um, way that the virus can enter into cells, and we want to block that. So by producing that protein, our own body realizes this is something that is not me and it creates antibodies, um, which then attach and tell our, our immune cells that know how to attack things that are not part of ourselves and get rid of them to come and get rid of these proteins. Because these antibodies are then created, if the virus comes along that includes that same protein in it, um, our, our antibodies and our immune cells see this and go, we recognize it, we know how to get rid of it, it's already primed and ready. And so rather than us getting infected or rather than us getting severely infected so that we have um, bad symptoms, it could attenuate the disease as well. This allows us to fight off an infection very quickly because we've already produced those proteins, our immune cells know it, they recognize it and they can get rid of it. And there's also a common misconception about this vaccine around the fact that it can alter your DNA. Will you speak to that really quickly on what the difference is between maybe a vaccine that has live virus versus this one? Right, so in terms of those things that can actually um, impact or change our DNA, uh, an mRNA vaccine cannot do that. It does not interact or um, relate to the DNA in our body. Um, it just goes into our protein making um, mechanism within the cytoplasm of the cell and will create proteins, but it will not, it, it will not in, include itself into our DNA. It will not um, be permanent. In fact, the mRNA that is brought in is actually um, removed from the body. It, it dissolves over um, just a, a very short period of time. And you mentioned earlier that there's two different vaccines currently available on the market, the Pfizer vaccine and the Moderna vaccine. Can you explain what the differences are in those two vaccines as well? Yeah, so the only difference that we really see as individuals is the ages of people who can get it. Um, it was studied in people ages 16 and older for the Pfizer vaccine and for people who are 18 and older for the Moderna vaccine. So those are th that age indication impacts us. The other thing that um, we, would, we would notice a difference in is the difference of timing between the doses, where the Pfizer vaccine between your first and second dose, there's a 21 day separation between the, uh, and there's a 28 day separation for, between the first and second dose for the Moderna vaccine. Um, and the only reason for that is that's how their studies were conducted. And so the data that they have that supports their use is when it's being used in that manner. In terms of how they're constructed, so close to each other, their data that's come out of their studies, so close. It really, these, these vaccines are, there really is not a preference one vaccine or the other. Um, and so essentially we should just go for the vaccine at the location that we can receive it. That is important though, is to go back to the same location where you got your first dose because you want to make sure you always get the same vaccine first and second dose. If you got a Pfizer the first time, get a Pfizer for your second dose. If you got a Moderna vaccine for the first time, get the Moderna vaccine. And each facility usually has houses just one kind of vaccine so that we're able to um, provide the same doses for the same individuals that have come in. 
And as far as the <laughs> Pfizer one goes as well, um, there's the need for it to be kept at a certain temperature. Is that correct? And, and can you explain why that is the case? Yeah. So um, again, the Pfizer vaccine um, and Moderna vaccine both are frozen, but the Pfizer in its production is frozen at a much lower temperature. So it's, it's an ultra frozen vaccine and needs specialized freezers. Um, it also comes in a smaller amount of doses per vial, anywhere between we can get six, five to six doses out of a vial, where the Moderna vaccine can be kept in a regular freezer and, um, and then it, its vial contains 10 doses. So they're different there. The reasons why um, those are uh, done is because that's how the production and manufacturing occurs um, and that's how they've been held so again, it's, it's, a, it's a manufacturing choice, it's a manufacturing structure, and it's how those plants work. So you mentioned before that there's this time period between the first dose and the second dose for Pfizer, it's that 21 day period for Moderna, it's 28 days. Is it possible for someone to actually contract COVID-19 in between the two doses? It is, and in fact, people did during the studies. So what we find is that these are extraordinarily effective vaccines. Um, after the second dose, what you're looking at is about a 95% protection. And I'm going to explain that in some numbers just so that we can understand why it's important to have two doses. And then we'll talk a little bit about getting infected in between. So if you have 100 people who did not get vaccinated in your, in your population, um, for every 100 people who were not vaccinated that get sick, with a 95% protection, that means that only 5% of people so only five people in the, out of uh, would be um, would become ill over time after having received the vaccine. With one dose, it's only 52% effective. So that means for every hundred people who get sick that are not vaccinated, 50 people. So you, you've only reduced your risk by half, but it's a five-fold difference in terms of your protection from five people to 50, um, first dose to second dose. So the second dose is critical for us to get full protection of the population. Um, but that means there are still people, no, these vaccines are not 100% effective. There are still some people who can become ill with COVID after having two doses, but that's a very small percentage of individuals in terms of their risk. And after your first dose, you've only cut your risk of infection by half, okay? So there are still people that we find are getting um, the, that are, that are still getting infected after their first dose. What that means for us here in our state is that um, individuals either before they get their two doses or if they've had one dose and then become ill, um, there's a waiting period. We are gonna wait 90 days um, after you've had your illness, after you've tested positive for COVID to either start your set vaccine series or if you've had one dose and then become ill, we're gonna wait another 90 days before you get your second dose. And there's a couple of reasons for that. One of them is that this has been um, regulated by our governor. He said, you know what, I want to make sure that people who are protected from the virus, um, we don't have to vaccinate them right now. And what we find and what the CDC's let us know is that after you've had an infection, there should be a period of about 90 days where you will be well protected against becoming reinfected. Okay, so you've got uh, your, your immune system's primed up, you're ready to, to uh, protect yourself, and so we don't need to vaccinate individuals in that 90 day period. And he's saying, look, if there are people out there who are not protected, we shouldn't be vaccinating people who've already had COVID in that 90 day frame, time frame. When they're, when they're, when they're safe, we don't want to vaccinate individuals um, that are already protected. We want to make sure we save those doses for people who are not protected against it. So that's one reason. The other one is we just want to be able to tell the difference between when you get sick with COVID Sometimes 10 days, two weeks later, you can have increased and in, in, in symptoms that come up um, with, with an, in, an enhanced immune response. We don't want to have you get a vaccine in the meantime that then we don't know, was the vaccine creating this enhanced immune response or was it the virus itself? We wanna keep those two things separate. And so for clinical reasons, we want that 90 day spread as well as for the reason to make sure that those who are not protected get the doses they need. So we've talked about the fact that there's this delay between the first dose and the second dose, and you can potentially get COVID as well. 
what can you be doing uh, to protect yourself to make sure that you're not contracting COVID or reducing your risk of getting COVID between the first and second doses? Great question. And this is the thing that we always need to stress, whether a person's had no doses of vaccine, if they've had one dose of vaccine, and even after they've had two doses, we are going to need to make sure we still do the um, mitigating strategies that we have to prevent spread of infection. And that means we need to be masking. We need to be washing our hands. If we are having symptoms of illness, we should not be around anybody else. Um, if we know we have an infection or have been exposed, we need to quarantine and stay away from other individuals so we won't be spreading disease to vulnerable individuals. Um, and that's so all of those stages at this point in time, until COVID has been essentially removed out of the community, we have got to keep doing all of those other um, infectious disease spread controlling activities. That's really good advice. And it's something like you mentioned that regardless of if you've gotten the doses or not, you should be considering. And I think it's important to note that even when you get your second dose, you should still be wearing a mask and making sure you're following those public health guidelines because you need to keep those around you safe, um, which is kind of a question someone just asked us. If a large number of people don't get the vaccine, will it actually ben benefit anyone, even the people who have been vaccinated? Yes, yeah, so it, um, and great question, uh, because there are things that allow us to get a benefit from personally having our immune systems um, primed up and ready to fight the infection. So yes, getting the vaccine will benefit us personally, but unless we get a large enough portion of the population to be vaccinated or to be immune, we have, we have to make sure there's enough immunity, we will not control the spread of the disease. And actually people who are vaccinated, um, the vaccines work better in an environment where there's less exposure as well. Okay, so um, just we, what we find is that as we get above these herd immunity thresholds, um, we get outbreak of disease even in highly vaccinated populations. And so that's where we have, it's, it's, you're, you're trying to reduce risk in both ways. And if you don't get enough, um, of, if you don't get people under that that threshold for these diseases, we don't we don't essentially control the spread of the disease. So we we are still going to be months out from having a good control over the spread of the infection because <clears throat> we have to have the time to get um, a large enough portion of the, of the population protected. Another quick question on the first versus second dose. Someone just asked us, does the first dose allow for an enhanced immune response to COVID, meaning that if you get the virus, you're less likely to have severe symptoms? So, um, yes. So, so it's, and there's, I think I wouldn't use the term enhanced immune response. That's, a, that's actually a term we use when someone um, is having worsening symptoms um, due to the, their immune system kicking in and giving them worse symptoms. So let's, let's, we'll use a different kind of terminology for that. Um, but yes, you do have a supportive immune response, one where um, once you've gotten vaccinated, there, sh there is the potential to have fewer individuals who are getting the disease. So it cuts your risk in half of contracting um, COVID. And that is, but then that's symptomatic COVID. Okay, so we're, it's not just, uh, cutting your risk in terms of asymptomatic, but people having symptoms with COVID, it's cutting that risk. It has, we don't have a study that shows us for those who become infected, how serious is it? But the indications are from those individuals that have been in the studies that it, it will most likely also reduce um, the, uh, the seriousness of the disease um, because what the, the T cell is the good kind of T cell response. You're getting a, uh, a neutralizing antibody response that helps reduce those symptoms. We are not getting the Th2 cell response, which can give that enhanced disease after you've had that just one dose. Okay, so it's, 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 it's working with the immune system the way we want it to. That's good information. I think that's helpful to note that 50% piece I think is really important. Another question around um, the first versus second dose of the vaccine. There's been reports that the second dose has a higher side effect reaction. Mm -hmm. um, 
what have we kind of been seeing? Um, and if you don't get side effects with the first dose, could you still get them for the second dose? Yes, oh, thank you for that, those questions. So yeah, we'll, we'll talk about the first versus the second. If you are having few symptoms the first time, you can get more symptoms the next time. If you had a lot of symptoms the first time, you could be getting less the second time. So first time and second time doesn't necessarily, what, what happens in the first dose doesn't necessarily predict what will happen in your second dose is what I should say. When it comes to the whole population that was studied, what we found is that the uh, percentage of people having the expected immune uh, responses with the vac with um, symptoms that would come along with that. So here's these are the expected things that happen when we stimulate our immune systems. It's the same thing that happens when we stimulate them with the with an actual virus. We get fevers because that's a fighting mechanism in our body. Um, that helps the immune system fight an infection. So when the immune system turns on, fever is very common to come along with that. We get maybe some aches and chills, headache. Um, all of those symptoms are expected and happen more frequently with the second dose. Okay. Um, also, red, the localized reactions that we might have, some redness, some swelling, um, pain at the injection site, that tends to be... Uh, pretty frequent in the, with the first dose, a little bit more frequent in the second dose as well. So um, just as an example, the one that we see the biggest differential and the one that might impact individuals because they won't want to go into work or into other settings when they have this because they want to make sure they're not sick is fever. Um, we check people's temperature to make sure that people aren't sick at the time they come into places. So in the Pfizer studies, uh, we were seeing about 4% of individuals had a fever after the first dose. Uh, that amount um, in both Pfizer and Moderna, it was increased to about 15 to 17% of people would have a fever. The nice thing is these are time limited. It usually happens the day after the vaccination, you know, 12 hours to 24 hours after the vaccination and resolves within about 24 hours. So within about 48 hours, most, any, most of these symptoms should have resolved. So maybe some takeaway advice is don't plan something super, super important the next morning, uh, just yeah. to make sure you give your body enough time to make sure it's healing correctly. And I think it's Correct. important to note that depending on your, if you have a super severe reaction, if you need medical attention, please go get the medical attention that you need. We're not going to turn you away because you're having a reaction. So I think that's no, just no. important to note. If you need medical attention, please go get it on that. And just in terms of treatment of these um, reactions, it's it's good to know that for um, if you're f feverish, not feeling well, uh, the CDC says don't take medications ahead of getting the vaccine, like a, an acetaminophen, a Tylenol, or an um, anti-inflammatory before you get the va the vaccine. We don't want to cut down the uh, the eff eff effectiveness because essentially we want an immune response. We want to have th these symptoms come on um, as part of your immune system's uh, uh, ability to mount a, a protective effect. But if these symptoms are super uncomfortable for you, if you're miserable, CDC says you can go ahead and take a Tylenol. You can go ahead and take an anti-inflammatory if you need to modulate some of those symptoms. Um, if people have serious reaction. So, and that's why we actually have individuals wait because we want to make sure they're not having some allergic reaction to the vaccine. So we wait and keep watch them observe for 15 minutes. For some individuals who are at are high risk for allergy, we'll keep them as long as 30 minutes um, to make sure that there's no, no bad uh, effects from them having gotten the vaccine. And we have systems in place to treat any kind of allergy, and also to refer and get people into um, an emergency department if that, that that's happened on a very rare basis, but um, we have the processes for making that happen. Speaking of the vaccine being safe, I wanna just touch on a couple of different groups that could potentially be getting the vaccine uh, soon. The first group is the high risk population. Is the vaccine safe for someone who's say over 75 and has some pre-existing conditions? Those are great questions. Yeah. The, so, yes, the study, um, the studies that were done on both Moderna and Pfizer, looked specifically at individuals at higher um, ages, and um, individuals who had conditions such as diabetes or heart disease or lung disease to make sure that the vaccine didn't do anything to um, 
uh, have, have any safety concerns in terms of adverse effects for those. Interestingly enough, um, because as older individuals, just like the rest of us ages, our immune systems age too, we don't tend to respond as vigorously to a stimulus to our immune system as younger individuals do. So it was clearly seen that um, the, the people who were uh, older individuals had much fewer of the adverse side effects because they just their immune systems just didn't rev up and weren't running and racing to, to protect them. Uh, and that can affect effectiveness. It means that they, the vaccine may not be as effective. And that's why, again, two doses is critical for those individuals who are high risk or older. And then the individuals who are um, high risk, we saw no difference in terms of the safety profile between someone who was high risk or not high risk. And what about pregnant women? I, I know that the clinical trials do not specifically um, include pregnant women for ethical reasons, but um, I, what is your opinion on pregnancy or someone who's trying to get pregnant for taking this vaccine? So there's, there's uh, three populations that uh, the CDC has called out that we need to discuss and have uh, and make sure that they understand the lack of information we have for them. Those are people who are pregnant, who are breastfeeding, and people whose immune systems are not working as well. We call them immunocompromised. And that can be either through medications they're taking, radiation that they're having, um, or, or a disease condition that they might have. Um, and the, But that's not, it's autoimmune conditions were looked at, that's not, and that, that isn't a concern, that condition. But sometimes people with autoimmune conditions will be on an immunosuppressant. And that's where we would, would want to discuss that population. So for pregnant individuals, what we have to be able to tell them is it wasn't studied in people who were pregnant. Um, we sh there's nothing within the pregnancy that should um, impact the effectiveness of the vaccine or in an, an individual who's breastfeeding, it shouldn't affect the effectiveness. But from a safety standpoint, we want to be super careful that we are not doing anything that would injure um, the, the child that the pregnant woman's carrying. So that, this is where we have to say, look, there, you have two risks. One is we can give you the vaccine and we don't know what the safety profile is for that. Or you all, we also know that people who get COVID and are pregnant do have worse outcomes and can have outcomes that affect their child. So this is, um, it, it, it really is going to have to be a personal risk. How much does the, does the woman believe that they will be out and, and at risk of contracting the disease? versus um, an unknown risk with, uh, because we don't have evidence around it um, for the vaccine. And so that's the discussion we have to have is for people to make a personal choice. And I, we all wish we had more information to provide to them in making that choice. Um, same thing, and it's exactly the same discussion for breastfeeding women. The other group though, the immunocompromised, were just like the older individuals, we're not quite as so much concerned about the safety issue because it's, we, this is not a live vaccine. This is not a vaccine that would impact them um, negatively. So we don't see, feel like the, the, the basics is we're probably going to see fewer side effects in an immunocompromised person from the vaccine. The concern here is effectiveness. So someone whose immune system is not working as, and as primed as uh, the general population, they may not get as much protection from the vaccine. And so they have to weigh out, well, if I take a vaccine that doesn't protect me as well, um, or I'm taking my chances out there of getting infected, which one do I do? And we have to just let them know we don't have the information about its effectiveness in the immunocompromise to let them know. I think that's a really uh, great point to bring up about the data. And also I, I think as someone who is either pregnant or breastfeeding or thinking about it, having conversations with your friends and family about it could be helpful as well. If you know someone who got the vaccine who's pregnant, that's a great person to talk to seeing how they're doing with it, um, if they have any advice. But like you said, it is a very personal choice. Talk to your doctor uh, and have those discussions about the safety for yourself personally. It is, and we have many individuals who are healthcare providers who feel that they're at high risk because they're being exposed to COVID patients on a regular basis. And they are choosing, um, as our, our pregnant caregivers, many are choosing to become um, uh, vaccinated. And there are, the studies are not being conducted yet, but we're working towards in our state having some studies for uh, pregnant individuals who want to enroll who've been vaccinated. But around the country, there are studies looking at individuals who've been, who are, who are pregnant, who've been vaccinated, and, and we'll get more data on that soon. 
Another quick question for you. Can you just give an update on how many vaccines Intermountain itself has distributed? Yeah, happy to do that. So let's see, I'm trying to think my final numbers here um, because they change daily. We did another 900 people yesterday. Uh, we're at about uh, 32,000 people, somewhere in that range, 31, 32,000 people that, well, actually that's how many vaccines. We've actually started giving second doses of vaccine to um, some of our healthcare providers and have, have given about 4,000 doses of that. So in terms of first doses, it's about 20, uh, 26,000 people. And I think it's about uh, 4,000 or people that have had, had the second dose. As far as the general public, I know there's a lot of questions around when certain groups of people can start getting the vaccine. And the governor uh, talked about people over the age of 70 and teachers last week during the press conference. Can you just give us a general update and then I'll get to some specific questions around that. Okay, great. Yeah, so um, we really have been moving through the priority groups that were informed by the CDC and then finalized um, by uh, giving ha having the Utah Department of Health getting local input on priorities and then the governor making final decisions on uh, how the tiering would go. And it's and how quickly we move through those levels or tiers depends on how much vaccine we have sent to our state. So the um, first group has been uh, in December the and start in this month as well, health care pro uh, providers. and emergency medical staff, as well as the um, uh, first responders. And our, low, our the, the great thing is we have vaccine getting out to our long-term care facilities and their staff for the residents and the, and the staff there. Uh, that's going to be I, hopefully mostly got, gotten through in the state within about the next 10 days. Um, all of those facilities will have been covered. We're, that's a critical population. That's the one that we've had the highest um, hospitalization and death rates from. And so we wanna make sure that group is well protected. And the next phases are that were announced is that this week, uh, some individuals in the K through 12 uh, education group would be getting vaccine. And even a couple of health departments have been able to have enough doses to open up to those ages 70 and above and had appointments for them this week. Uh, but that is going to be happening more broadly with the next delivery of vaccine next week. There's, of course, this is dynamic and changing. It was, um, we were going to be doing peaceables over 75 until last Friday when we heard from the governor that he was moving it down to age 70. And there have been national proposals, um, just Trump administration this week declaring that they would like people 65 and over to get the vaccine, as well as some people who have high risk conditions. Um, and just like we have done. Uh, with the recommendations from the CDC in the past, the governor will look at what vaccine we have in our state and its availability, how many individuals we have in each of those tiers, and decide if there will be any change from what was announced on Friday for the 70 and above. Um, but all of us are taking our direction from our governor um, and our uh, Utah Department of Health. I think it's important to note too, if someone is watching this that doesn't live in Utah, each state is a little bit different. I have grandparents who live in Florida and there's a 65 and up, which is making it a little bit harder for that population to get the vaccine. So I think it's important to make sure you're looking at the correct health department um, for your information yeah. if you are happening to watch this from somewhere outside of the state. And, so. and it's even with even within the state, there are differences in local health departments, not in what criteria they're using, but in terms of how many, uh, what, what doses they have and how quickly they can move down to other tiers. So where some health departments um, have been able to open up some slots for people over age 70 this week, others are not going to be able to do that until next week. So, it's, so you have to look at uh, your own local health department and what's available there and when they are able to provide it to you. That brings up my next question too, which you kind of answered, but what is the best way for the public to find out when they can get vaccinated, how they can get vaccinated and kind of keep up to date with what's going on in the state? Okay, so at this point for the population who is now looking for vaccine, um, our healthcare providers, our um, EMS, our K through 12 and our um, uh, people 70 and above, those are the ones that are in those categories. It, the, the source of truth is your local health department. Um, so, and that is also your access point in most cases. 
Now, the health department um, may have worked with other organizations for delivery. So we have community nursing services that is going out to um, our long-term care facilities. Uh, community nursing services also working with school districts to um, have certain sites available um, on a district basis for their K through 12. Uh, but that local health department websites are going to be the place that you'll be able to find out where to access the vaccine. Um, we have uh, you know, th those other large pharmacy chains that have been going out to the um, long-term care facilities as well. Uh, but for healthcare providers, long-term uh, long care is having it brought to them, but the healthcare providers, the EMS, um, those who are in, in education and over 70, go to your local health department website. Um, that's where both information is available as well as the ability to sign up um, for open slots. And it's, um, there are great ways to actually access those. There's an association of local health departments. Um, their website is available so people can get to any of the local health departments. Um, as everybody's very aware of that, that coronavirus.gov website that we go to to look at epidemiology, if you go to their vaccine section of that website, they also have a listing of all of the different local health department websites for access. Um, if you come to the Intermountain Healthcare uh, and dot, the Intermountain Healthcare website, which is the intermountain.com slash COVID vaccines, that website will um, also direct you to local health department websites. And I'll put those links into the Facebook Live afterwards for people to view. Um, but I think it's important to note, like you've said, each department is kind of doing things a little bit differently. So make sure you're looking at the correct place. I know that uh, I have a friend who's a healthcare professional outside of a hospital setting, and she went through the Salt Lake County uh, system and was able to drive up and got a vaccine, and it was very simple. So just make sure you keep checking those resources and uh, when it's your turn to kind of get ahead of it and make sure you're aware. Um, someone asked a question. So in, in the nearby future, essential workers will be eligible to get a vaccine. Um, and the state is going to be defining what jobs are considered essential. According to your opinion, um, who do you think essential workers are that should get this vaccination next? I know this is a very personal question. So yeah, your no, <laughs> and, and actually I think, um, but my opinion doesn't count. Um, I, I think that that is it really, when we have, we, we can look toward what the CDC has indicated are essential workers. They spent months over this year studying which individuals um, were both at most risk, which could create the most risk in their work and which ones are needed for the infrastructure of our country. And they have the right suggestions. Um, so uh, then the problem is, each of us as individuals may may have a difference in terms of our opinion of priority. Um, and so I think that what the state has done in terms of bringing a group of experts together to provide that feedback, um, look at what the CDC has recommended, provide feedback for what we believe in our local area. Uh, those, those are informed decisions of not just one individual in their opinion, but many individuals in their, and their uh, expertise and knowledge. I think that's a, a great answer and really important to consider that, like you've said, everyone's version of essential is very different depending on who you're talking to. So the fact that there's this group of people making these decisions is, is, is a really great thing. Um, another quick question for you too. I know that right now we have the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines available. Are there any other vaccines coming down the pipeline in the near future? Yes. Um, so the one that seems to be the farthest ahead from what I've seen, um, and it's just the information that's filtered out to us is the Janssen. Um, it's, it's a combination of Janssen and Johnson and Johnson that are working on this vaccine. The real advantages of this one, it is a one dose vaccine. So much easier to get out to a population and it's refrigerated rather than frozen. Um, so we're looking forward that hopefully by sometime in January, we'll get some interim data on that vaccine. And then they would make it an application probably in the February, March timeframe from the, um, for an emergency use authorization, if things look good from their data. So that's one that we're, we're kind of watching toward. 
don't have really good t timelines on the AstraZeneca or the um, Novavax vaccines. Those are the other ones that are somewhat in the in the pipeline and are in phase three trials um, or have completed those phase three and are in evaluation by the FDA um, in terms of how those trials were conducted um, so that they could be confident that we have the right information for uh, their decision making. So um, the the, there is there are a couple of other things down the pipeline that are not necessarily new vaccines, but new ways of using our current vaccine. Um, and one of them is because in the phase one and phase two trials where they determine best dosage to use for a vaccine, they'll, they'll move up the dosage and have it tested on individuals to see how, how reactive is it? How much do we get side effects from it? versus how effective is it in your, they, they check your blood to see do you, what, how many of the antibodies do you develop in comparison to other people who were sick with the disease um, and develop antibodies. So we look at people who con, call it convalescent serum, people who were sick and are now better. We look at their um, blood versus the blood of individuals who were receiving these vaccines. And with the Moderna vaccine, they had a 50 microgram amount they decided on the 100 microgram amount. That was you know, giving them the biggest boost, the best amount of effectiveness with a, an acceptable amount of side effect where the 50 microgram dose wasn't terrible, but it, I mean, it, it actually was quite good in terms of its responsiveness and, and what we saw with immune, uh, immune stimulation. So the question is, could we be using a smaller dose of the Moderna vaccine and still getting enough impact? We don't want to give a suboptimal amount. So it's the same type of thing with the two doses. We don't want to give too little because then we can um, prime the immune system, but, but not with enough neutralizing antibodies to have a really robust effect. And that can actually cause us to um, have but worse, you know, we, part of what we do is we develop memory. So we want to have a certain amount of time we remember how to fight against the disease. And that could definitely impact the memory. Um, and in an older population, it may just not be enough to create the, the immune response we want. So we don't want to do a suboptimal amount, but the FDA is looking to say, could, could we expand what we're doing with just a, a less, less dosage? So that's that, that's those are some of the new things um, that are on the horizon. And I know that in other countries too, they're um, using the AstraZeneca trial is happening a lot in the UK, I do believe. But there's other things coming down, like you've said, that as we get more data and more information, we'll update the public to kind of let them know what's available um, in their area specifically. Is there anything else that you wanted to mention to us about vaccines or any updates you wanted to give before we take off for the day? Yeah, one thing that I do want to emphasize, and this is where we're talking about um, future uh, access points. So one of the concerns that we've had right now for the populations um, that the, the doses of vaccine that we have, the populations who are looking for it, the local health departments are your source. Um, in the future, we will have some hospitals that will be doing some mass vaccination. We will also have pharmacies and clinics over time signing up to provide vaccine, but this is mainly going to be smaller amounts of, of doses available in these settings, and they are not there now. We're really having problems with um, our pharmacies, our clinics being inundated with phone calls of patients who are saying, I'm 70, it's time for me to get my vaccine, can I come in and get it? And there are no clinics out there that have vaccine. Okay, so we need to let people know your access points to the local health departments your doctor's office is not going to be able to help you with it at this point in time, possibly a couple months down the road. Yes, that will be um, a, a potential place for you to get a vaccine, but, and that will be communicated out to the public. But at this point, we need to realize local health departments are our access point um, or places that they've um, sent it to like community nursing services, providing it at those uh, school district um, uh, events as well. That's really great information. And like I mentioned before, I will put those links to the different websites in the Facebook Live right after we finish. Tamara, thank you so much for joining us and giving us an update. We really appreciate it. And we will talk to you in a bit. Thank you. Uh, always a pleasure. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.